Scanning for audio. Welcome once again to a Tin Dog Podcast. Ah yes, you thought I was doing, well, Blake 7 all this summer. And I am. But I'm also doing my Big Finish reviews and, in the case of today's podcast, some books. There'll be three that I'll be reviewing over this summer. And the first is City of Death by James Goss. Except it's not by James Goss, it's by Douglas Adams. Except it's not by Douglas Adams, it's by David Fisher. Except it's not by any of them, it's by all of them. Now we all know the stories behind City of Death, and we all know that it's one of the handful of stories that was never, ever adapted into, well, a target novelization. Because when you were a kid, when you were little like me, when you were growing up and video recorders were something you saw in the background on TV screens and you never thought you'd own one in the house and you never, ever thought you'd own Doctor Who, the nearest you could ever have was target novelizations. And I set out to create a full set. Now, I have a full set of Target novelizations. They're currently at my parents' house, but they do exist, and they're all nicely boxed up. And they're at my parents' house, and they're all nicely boxed up. However, that's not what's important. The important bit is, is the City of Death was never adapted into a novel to shove on your shelf, so there was a gap. Oh, how gaps annoy us Doctor Who fans. What we require is completion. Like life, you can never truly have everything, because then nothing comes up that says end of level. What happens is, is nothing. You just have a full set, and then you ignore it. Oh no. Here we've got a new book. We've got one more gap filled on the shelf. All right, it doesn't have a lovely Chris Arkelios cover. Not yet. I'm sure somebody out there will be doing it when the paperback comes out. But right now, we have the James Goss hardback. Of course, James Goss wasn't supposed to be writing this. A certain Mr. Roberts, who'd brought us the sublime version of Sharda, again, something that was missing from our target shelves, well, that wasn't released either. He was a bit busy, I don't know, possibly writing Doctor Who. So he gets his mate, James Goss, and you go, OK, I've come across James Goss's work in the past. He's very, very good. But why is he doing this? And then you do some research. Good old-fashioned proper research. So you see, James Goss not only met Douglas Adams, but he also adapted Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency for the stage. This guy actually knows what he's doing. Now, everyone loves Douglas Adams' work. The nicest thing anybody has ever said about my writing was that it's a combination of Douglas Copeland and Douglas Adams brought together. That's not quite how it was said, There was a swear word involved in the word son. But yeah, basically, that's what somebody said about my writing. And that is what I always think about whenever I can't do it. I always think, right, be that person, be that good. Adams, of course, according to, well, Stephen Moffat, taught Doctor Who scriptwriters absolutely nothing. Because he was a genius. And as a genius, well, he didn't actually managed to show anybody anything else because he was his own universe he was a law unto himself as well not always the most reliable of authors but often the funniest and most succinct the story of how city of death was written is as well catalogued elsewhere basically david fisher provides a lovely little script hands it in and then you get the chance to have more shooting in paris so a rewrite's needed and David Fisher's in the middle of a rather nasty divorce. So, Douglas Adams gets taken away by the producer, locked in his study, gets plied with whiskey and coffee, and gets told to, well, finish it off. And what he does is he rewrites the entire thing. The director pops round to provide more tea and coffee, and the script eventually gets written. City of Death, what's wildly received as one of the greatest Doctor Who stories of all time, that's all time, is simply remarkable, not only for the fact that it was written over the weekend, but it's remarkable for the fact that, well, 
some of the greatest lines in the episode were rewritten by Tom Baker. Tom and Lala's romance was actually, well, a good thing at the time. And when you're happy and in love, you provide some wonderful work. It also looks good, and it's got Doctor Who on location, which in the 70s is a pretty impressive thing. Thank you, unit production manager, Mr. JNT. So that's the reality, that's the video, that's the DVD, that's the story we watched because ITV was on strike and it got 17 million people watching it. It's just beloved. Also, the storyline eventually was lifted by Adams and converted into big chunks of Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, again much beloved. Where exactly David Fisher's work starts and ends and becomes Dirk Gently, that is for the lawyers and not for me. I just don't know. So, the actual being that is this book, it actually has far, far too many authors in order to put it down as one thing. Stick Douglas Adams' name on the front of a book, however, you will end up with a very nice set of sales figures. Let's face it, we'd all love another Douglas Adams book, but it's just not going to happen. And the problem with adapting a Douglas Adams' story is you sit there going, how would Douglas have done this? And of course the answer is you've no idea because he would have done it A, better, and B, more importantly, differently. Yes, you can try and put gags in it and side notes and footnotes, but that's not quite the same thing. That's just creating the impression of Adams. Everyone can just be funny in their own world, in their own way. And that's where James Goss shines. Because let's face it, this is a pretty impressive adaptation. Let's take it back to its basics again. We're back to the Target novelizations. Many of the original writers were approached by Target to write their own novelizations of their own stories. They knew all the characters. But many scriptwriters aren't natural novelists and it works the other way around as well. Creating prose to some people is like digging a ditch, while writing scripts and witty dialogue is like soaring. I must admit I've felt like this myself. However, Douglas Adams was approached and offered double the money to provide us with lovely City of Death novelisation, which he then declined and went off and wrote the Dirk Gently books. So, when one of these target novelisations wasn't being written by one of the original authors, and let's face it, that happened quite a lot, it often fell to somebody else to dig the ditch for them. Terence Dix often stood up and went, I'll do that and produced, well, enough work to make us all gloriously happy of the fact that we can read. Have I wandered just a touch? So other people were often called in to write these target novelizations. so somebody else like James Goss, who's got the track record, could produce something just as good. And that's the mindset you needed to produce something like this. And God, he's done it so well. I will read in a few moments the beginning of chapter one, just to give you a feeling of what it's like. But as far as I'm concerned, it's an absolutely fantastic version of The City of Death. Yes, there are some changes, because he's gone back to the original shooting script. And there's mentions of, well, I'll read it out in a moment, just to draw it all together with modern Doctor Who. So, imagine the first scene of City of Death, and then I will read it to you, and you can make up your own mind whether you want to buy it or not. But as far as I'm concerned... It's simply fantastic. It's Saturday night tea time in 1977 all over again. It was Tuesday and life didn't happen. Wednesday would be quite a different matter. Scaroth, the last of the Jaggeroth, was in for a surprise. For one thing, he had no idea he was about to become the last of the Jaggeroth. If you asked him about the Jaggeroth a mere, say, 20 seconds ago, he'd have shrugged and told you that they were savage, warlike race that if you weren't happy about that, you should meet the other guys. By and large, all life in the universe was pretty savage and warlike. Show me a race of philosophers and poets, said Scaroth, and I'll show you lunch. It would, however, be unfair to say that Jaggeroth were completely without accomplishments. They did build very nice-looking spaceships, though they were not necessarily very good ones. There was a lot to recommend the Sephiroth. A vast sphere rested on three claws. It suggested formidable menace, whilst evoking the kind of insect you'd not care to find in your bed. The tripod arrangement of its legs also meant that it could land on anything. Which was ironic, for right now it couldn't take off from anything. 
Something had gone very badly wrong in the drive unit almost as soon as they had landed on this desolation. They'd be hunting a Rachnos energy signal and had made planetfall, hoping for one more victory, just one more victory. The Jaggeroth had devoted themselves to killing. There was nothing else they'd leave behind them. No history, no literature, no statues. As a species, they'd never achieved anything other than wiping out life. The problem was that every other life form was equally dedicated to the same goal. So successful had everyone been that there really wasn't much life left in the universe. The Jaggeroth were one of the last ones standing. Even then, not by much. When the Jaggeroth talked about their fearsome battle fleet, the Sephiroth was pretty much it. Or actually, just it. Skaroth, pilot of the Sephiroth battle fleet of Jaggeroth, worried about this. Nice-looking spaceships, frankly mediocre drive systems, rhyming names, and, oh yes, a frankly lunatic determination to keep going. Hence, the voices of his shipmates that filled his command pod from across the ship. Twenty seconds to warp thrust, someone was counting down. Thrust against planet surface set to power three, and someone down in engineering was really keen on getting off this rock. Negative, Skaroth snapped back quickly. Power three too severe. Warp thrust was used to speed between the stars, not for liftoff. Even from thinly atmosphered, low gravity dead worlds, there were too many things which could go wrong. Warp thrust from a planet's surface had not been tested. At power three, this is suicide. The voices urging him fell silent at that. Of course they would. Please advise, he said curtly. Eventually, that keen voice in engineering came on the line. Skaroth, it must be power three. It must. Typically, the refuge of Jaggeroth is indefinite absolutes. Skaroth twisted his face into a cynical expression, well, as cynical as an expression as could be conveyed by a face that was a mass of writhing green tentacles grouped around a single eye. As pilot, Skaroth was in charge, the one to push the button. If history remembered this at all, it would be his fault. He knew that it was a stupid decision, but then again, from an evolutionary point of view, the Jaggeroth had made a lot of fairly stupid decisions. Ten seconds to warp thrust, prompted the countdown. Was there a trace of desperation in the voice? Skaroth ran his green hands over the terminal. If the Sephiroth had been working properly, warp control would have been a mass of status readouts, all of which he had been carefully trained to simultaneously process. Instead, the panels flashed up requesting urgent software updates, or was simply blank. Skoroth was relying on his instincts and the voices filling the module, and the rest of the crew seemed happy to leave it up to him. Advise, he repeated, hoping to hear someone speaking sense. The response that came was weary. Skaroth, the Jaggeroth are in your hands. Without secondary engines, we must use our main warp thrust. You know this. It's our only hope. You are our only hope. Thanks for that, thought Skaroth, his tentacles now positively quivering with cynicism. And I'm the only one directly in the warp field. In other words, I'll be the first one to go. I know the dangers. That was as close as a Jaggeroth had ever come to asking for a rethink. Once they committed to an idea, no matter how lethal or ludicrous, the Jaggeroth stuck to it. Confirming his thoughts, the countdown came back on, sounding quite determinedly chipper. Whatever something was going to happen now, three seconds, two, one, Scaroth had a last attempt. What will happen if all goes wrong? If the atmosphere and gravity combine with the warp thrust to do something really unexpected and horrible, starting with me? Ah well, what's the use? Arguing with the Jaggeroth had only ever ended in death. Skaroth pressed the button. On the 5th of September 2015, Hooverville will return. The biggest little Doctor Who convention in the whole of the UK is proud to present several fantastic guests. First off is THE Colin Baker, a man who needs absolutely no introduction. Guests also include the author Jenny Colgan, responsible for Dark Horizons and Time Trips, Richard Marson, the man behind GNT, The Life and Scandalous Times, and the brand new book Drama and Delight, the biography of Verity Lambert, Dan Starkey, 
the man behind the mask when it comes to Commander Strax, and of course Ian the Elf in the Christmas special. Terence Dix, one of the men behind the Third Doctor, and more target novelizations than you can shake a stick at. The actor David Benson, from Robot of Sherwood, Iris Wildheim, and the Scarifiers. Matthew Waterhouse, yes, Adrake. Michael Pickwood, the current production manager on Doctor Who, and Karen Louise Hollis, author of The Man Behind the Master, the biography of Anthony Inley. More guests may be added, but either way, that's a fantastic lineup. Visit the Derby Quad website on www.derbyquad.co.uk and follow the links. Saturday, the 5th of September 2015. See you there. You've been listening to the Tin Dog Podcast, available on RSS, iTunes, Stitcher, Audio Boom, and Tumblr. Doctor Who and its associated works are copyright of the BBC. No infringement is intended. You can contact the show, donate, buy merchandise, or find out more about my other projects by visiting the Tin Dog Podcast homepage and clicking on the links. The Tin Dog Podcast is a founder member of the Doctor Who Podcast Alliance. Mm-hmm.